Okay, so that's that. Configurations, even though they're um, of infinite energy, if they're uh, if they're simple singular configuration to go out to infinity, you can have one that looks like this: a plus here and a minus, and so the um, the theta goes around twice as fast in the middle, but in infinity, theta is quiet. And so I don't, I don't understand what we're talking about. <laughs> All right, I'm, 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 I'm trying to go too fast. Um, let me let me let me put it differently. Um, suppose we think of this not in two plus one but in three plus one dimen dimensions. Then what we're talking about is an ungauged vortex. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, this vortex. Engaged chalk. Um, this this vortex can do this and close on itself. Can form a closed loop. Well, then uh, you're fine. And obviously, this is the energy is finite okay? because um, uh, although the gauge, although the, the I keep saying gauge, although this theta goes around this way, it goes also around that way, and so at infinity it's not changing. In other words, the... If what's it? Are we saying this vortex is, is localized here? Somewhere, say, near the origin? And now you're talking it's about a, it's a, Now this, this, this phi, which has this form, at infinity, um, theta doesn't change. It's just V at infinity. Um, 
I must say that this was clear to me when I was thinking about it, and now it's not. It's not so. So this is the configuration of the field. Right. Field. And you're saying that as, and so it's only like I'm saying that I'm saying that it that it that phi that theta. First of all, it's theta. I mean, the phase is theta. Theta go as you go around this. Theta changes by two pi. But as you go around this way, it changes by minus two, minus two pi. And um, so, in particular, as you go from here to here, nothing happens. And what if we're like right at the very center of that loop? Well, that's just a finite region. You don't care about the finite region. You could have. A, you could have theta equal to zero here, pi there, and zero. Okay, that's the picture. So wouldn't it at the center also be zero because it's pi and then minus pi from the other one? I've got a pi here. Zero, zero, and as you go around this way, it changes to pi there. Alright. So this is uh, this is um, something that uh, has finite energy. Is theta the gauge field? Mm -hmm. We don't have a gauge field yet. But if you if you do put in a gauge field, in other words, you go to to the uh, that was fast. Where did I put in the gauge field? All right. So let's if you promote this to m is integral. Uh, d2x, and now it's d phi squared plus lambda phi squared minus d squared. Now where d is, um, or d phi, say, it's grad phi minus i e a phi. Okay, now uh, we don't have uh, a problem because, in fact, we can say that uh, a sub i is essentially minus i over e, 1 over b squared, b squared, I don't know why I've got so many terms here, but anyway, it's d i theta over e. If this is, if this is, uh, if a is like that, then the derivative here pulls down a d i theta, the e's cancel, and so this, this covariant derivative is, is okay, and the, the kinetic term disappears. And um, the flux, on the other hand, which is an integral b to xb, wait, well, this actually, I don't know why I have a 2 there. Uh, this is an integral of a dot dx, and you integrate a around, you get uh, 2 pi over e. So that's the flux. And um, as I said, this is the, the this is quantized in units of um, two, 2 pi over e in unnatural units is 2 pi h bar c over e, or it's h c over e. So this is the unit in um, type 2 supercomputer. Now, um, you can have this theory in 3 plus 1 dimensions, and then you have gauge vortices. And they are then, uh, have a finite energy per unit length. Um, on the other hand, if they form loops, they have a totally finite energy. And um, uh, so, you have then two sort of models of cosmic strings. One is the ungauged cosmic string, where you have loops. And then there's the gauge cosmic string, uh, where again, I don't know, it seems to me that you effectively have loops, because I, I can't imagine an infinitely long string. It just seems absurd. Um,
All right, so those are the two uh, kinds. We'll, I'll come back to this later. In fact, actually, maybe I should jump ahead and do the um, phase transition of costulates and thallus. Let me just do that really quickly. So what we've got is um, this can, in fact, be the ungauged strains. In fact, that's the, that's the picture. So we're looking at the ungraded, un, ungauged strains. And once again, what we're saying is that if we have a pair of these, like this, then in here, we've got some uh, big, grad phi is big between them, and it's smaller outside. And so the energy is something like v squared integral d2x 1 over r squared. And um, this is then uh, v squared log r over a, where a is essentially the size of the vortex, um, or if you want, the size of the, the in some sense, the size of the vortex. And so costlets and thalates uh, consider the free energy, which of course is E minus T times the entropy. And what's the entropy? Well, the entropy is the number of log of the number of states. And the log of the number of states is basically the size of the universe. The number of states is basically the size of the universe over the size of the vortex. And and so now what we've got is that the free energy is v squared minus t log L over A. And so then we've got a phase transition. So, uh, sorry, how, how did they figure that this is the number of states? Well, this is this is um, El Chico stat mech. Okay, uh, where and yet their paper has been cited like 4,000 times. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, you know, you have a vortex of a certain size, you can put it here or there or there or there. So it's basically, I mean, if you want, you can say it's L cubed over A cubed, but that's just a factor of three. So it's basically like this. So what does this mean? What this means is if T is greater than Tc, entropy wins. And, um, and by the way, Tc is V squared, where V is this parameter. And uh, then the system is a gas of, of vortices. So R equals L. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you get the last can. Uh, thanks. Sorry. Uh, I'll have to do something next time. Um, on the other hand, if T is less than T C, then the um, then what you have is a uh, vortex, anti-vortex. Uh, pairs, tightly bound. And um, it seems to me that's probably equivalent to just forming loops. So that's the costless thalus phase transition. And um, I think maybe I'll put together now. Uh, right. well, Do they uh, give any oh, estimate as to what they expect that ratio to be of L over A? That was the size of the universe. Yes. Well, put the universe in a box size L. Okay, so. I mean, it doesn't matter what that is. Yeah, it's just uh, an overall. You plug it in and it tells you. Yeah, it's just an overall thing. The total free. An overall thing. Yeah, because we're not sure. Yeah. 
Okay, so let me um, quickly um, remind remind you about um, uh, the homotopy groups. These are maps from uh, a sphere S n into um, some manifold M, and it's called pi n of M. Okay, and we would in 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 this particular case. We're talking about uh, what's M. M is where the field has to be at infinity. So the field has to be uh, e to the i theta, and so we're talking about a circle. And um, we've got the maps then from spatial infinity. Spatial infinity to the circle. And this map can be e to the i n theta as you go around here once, you go around there once. This is two dimensions. And um, so the group pi, what we have then is pi 1 of s1, which is z, the integers. Um, and as I said before, the king was. Was, uh, so you're thinking of Z as a group manifold? Well, Z is a group. Yeah, I know, but you have up here that the homotopy is a map from a sphere. Right, to but a manifold. the manifold is the circle. So, yeah. All right. That is to say, the field has to assume the hydrogens on the unit circle or on V times the unit circle at infinity. So for each point, as you go out at a particular angle, in, the, in other words, you've got this huge plane here in the vortex. As you go out at a particular angle, you have to have a certain, um, you're at a certain angle in the plane, but you also have to go to a certain angle, E, V, I, N, uh, theta in the, um, on the circle, and um, so I'm very confused about what theta is. All right, theta. One theta is the angle in the plane, the direction on, uh, sure. along which you go out to infinity. This, so this is, is a space. Base. This is a chord space. Base. Space. Space. Sure. Okay. But as you get out to infinity, you've got to be on the circle somewhere. So which circle are we talking about now? Any circle size. There's only one circle. Well, I mean, in this picture, can you draw right. where the circle is? What? I mean, in this picture, can you draw what, what you mean by that circle? That circle is the circle. That's the circle. So how is this different from the? It's, it's just that phi is v e v i n theta. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's the same theta, right? Yes. Okay. But of course it could be off by a constant. Well, I mean, that's just shifts where you measure theta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay. Now, um, let's go to 3 plus 1 uh, uh, quickly, and uh, we go from by a complex field to a vector field. Once again, the time-dependent configurations have energy, which is a half grad phi squared plus again lambda phi vector squared minus phi squared squared. So this is the, the same story. Now once again, the length of this vector has to go to V as R goes to infinity. So now we're talking, now spatial infinity is the sphere S2, theta and phi, how you go out to infinity. And when you're out there at infinity, this phi has to take, um, which is now a vector, a three vector, it has to be 
a three vector of length v, so it's somewhere on S2, the circle of the sphere, the, the ordinary surface of the sphere. And, um, okay, so what, what does that mean? That means that phi a is something like this. R x a, no, that's a v. V x a over r. x a are the coordinates. V is this magic number. And uh, this will clearly be a particular map. In fact, it's probably the simplest non-trivial map you can think of. Now, once again, we have, because of this dependence, the kinetic energy and infinity will diverge, but we can cure this with a um, gauge field. And so now we have di phi a is di phi a plus e epsilon a b c AIB BC. And it was a Hoft who first figured out how this would work. In particular, that AC sub I should go as something like 1 over E epsilon BIJ XJ over R squared. Now you can, you, can, you can see that if phi is this and A is that, then this covariant derivative gets smaller than infinity, the biggest term cancels. Okay. On the other hand, um, phi is having a value at infinity, namely V, the magnitude at infinity of V. And that means that in, well, I forgot to promote this to a gauge theory, it's then d cubed x, one half d v squared plus lambda v squared minus v squared squared. So in this theory, this thing is finite, that's finite, everything's hunky-dory. On the other hand, because phi assumes a length v in the ground state, uh, we've got a mass term appearing here, just the ordinary Anderson-Higgs mechanism. Okay. Do you want to see that explicitly? Do you want me to pound it out? The mass term... No. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, what is it going to be? Well, we're going to ignore the derivative. It's just going to, it's going to be a one half. It's going to be an e squared from here. And then it's going to be epsilon a, b, c, epsilon a, b prime, c prime, a, b, i. Um, this is going to be v. And it's going to be x um, c over r. And then it's going to be a b prime. And the i is going to be the same. And it's going to be x c prime over r times, of course, v. So you just squared that then? That's what we're doing? Yes. Okay. It just, it, that's where all of these mass terms come from. Yeah. It comes from the square of the covariant derivative, and you take seriously the magnitude of the Higgs field. And now, um, this thing then is equal to a half e squared, and then there's a standard identity for this, which is delta delta minus delta delta. E and e prime c b c. c all right, let me just do it. This b c b e prime b prime c prime c prime b prime, 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 prime a b i a b prime i. And there's a 
v squared tends an r squared and um, then we have xc x c prime and so this is one half v squared e squared over r squared okay a b a i b squared and then um, r squared minus and now we have basically a dot x i squared and um, okay so this is telling us that it's that the gauge field, in other words, if I pull out a factor of r squared, it's one half v squared e squared times a i vector squared. This is the spatial vector. This vector is the a b c goes to is one two three minus a dot x hat i squared. So this is saying basically that the gauge field in the x hat direction is massless. But the other two, the transverse, transverse to x gauge fields get a mass, and the mass they get is VE. Okay. So this is the Higgs mechanism in this particular case. Now, the fact that the mass, that the gauge field in the x hat direction is, remains massless means that effectively, if you're sitting in a lab way off in space, away from this uh, configuration, you're out where this, this is taking place, uh, the, 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 the massless field is the one that's pointing this way, so to speak, in flavor space. And so if you take the, let me call this, I want to make this sort of a, I don't know how to make, I'm afraid I've lost my penmanship skills. Um, this is, Wolf's formula. Which, uh, where did the direction x hat get favored over other directions? It came in by, first of, all, first of all, we took this as our ansatz, and then we took this, we had to take this in order to cancel, in order to minimize the kinetic energy. Yeah, but and, you, and then this a, a dot x came I guess just from this, from, this, from this delta delta identity. Yeah, but that, that x is not just the coordinate x, but it's x, y, and z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it's x vector. And it's x vector dotted into the flavor vector of A. And so this is Static plus a half EI phi squared. 
squared plus b of phi. This thing, you can do another one of these bogo. No, it's not that. It's the other guy. Yes. Good for you. Um, and what you do, I'm going to leave out the factors of two. What you basically do is you say f squared, this of course is b squared, the non abelian magnetic field squared. f squared plus d phi squared is f plus or minus, and then there's this tricky epsilon ijk dk phi ij squared. So if I put in the I might as well put it in factors. A quarter, a half, minus a plus a half. Okay, so this is this is just arithmetic, but then you can show that m is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the integral d cubed x of minus a plus a half epsilon i j k f i j flavor dotted into d k of phi uh, plus v of phi absolute value and then there's something tricky done you look at what this is and you see that the integral d q x of a half epsilon i j k f i j or let me do it this way f i j a d k v a is effectively d cubed x a half epsilon i j k d k f i j dot v so you've integrated by parts there, and we somehow no, we haven't. Well, we've done a sort of integration by parts. It's that um, when the derivative, when this derivative hits the phi, you get this term. When this derivative hits the f, because f has derivative with respect to i and j, and because this is anti-symmetric, you get zero. And um, which, of course, is just the statement delta b is zero. Divergence of b is zero. Um, which mass? And I, well, I, I basically said that the gauge field is falling off enough so that, so that this goes away. Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a little, although maybe, maybe there's a symmetry argument for that. Anyway, let's, let me say that I don't remember quite how the gauge field part goes away. Let's just say it does. Well, it turns out that this is just V integral. This is basically, the, this is the magnetic field in the sense that apart from V, because this is the phi hat direction, the x hat direction. Phi is proportional to x hat. So this is ds dot B. And this is then 4 pi v g, where g is the charge, the magnetic charge of this magnetic monopole. This is what we're talking about here is magnetic monopole. And um, we've left out v, and so what we've got then is the m is greater than or equal to 4 pi v g, um, because of there's also the potential energy, and um, a. Uh, a pair of people, Prasad and some of you, not our Prasad, but some other Prasad, um, uh, wrote down a theory of, um, of the magne uh, uh, a theory here where they arrange the constants to be such that uh, they basically took a limit in which the potential energy was zero. And um, so, in a sense, you can basically saturate. Okay, so that's that. Are, are, are there any questions about that? Because I was about to to go on. Notice, by the way, that this is 
this is again the homotopy group of pi 2 of S2, which is again the integers. All right, now, um, last week or the week before, we were talking about differential forms and their use in non abelian uh, their use in, in I don't know, non abelian gauge theory, but we didn't really, didn't really, we actually talked about differential forms in a more general context and not in terms of gang mills fields. So now I want to just focus on their use in uh, in Yang Mills uh, theory. So A is a one form of, and it looks like that. Notice what happens if we take A squared. Then this is A mu, A nu, dx mu, dx nu, but because this is anti-symmetric, this is effectively a half A mu comma A nu, dx mu, dx nu. We're leaving out the wedge. There's a wedge there, but we're not writing it explicitly. And um, here, this a mu is minus i a a mu t a, where the t a's are the generators t a t b i t b c t c. So these are these are the uh, generators in. The algebra. Okay, now let's think about under a gauge transformation. A prime is going to be, well, we talked about gauge transformations last time. U A, U dat, well, not last time, but we can write it this way. And why can we write it that way? Well, this is U A, U dagger plus U partial U dagger with respect to mu, dx mu, and this, so this is the standard gauge transformation, non abelian gauge transformation. So um, what happens to da prime? Well, operating with d up there, we get du a u dagger plus u d a u dagger minus u a d u dagger plus d u d u dagger. Okay. Now, what is a prime square? Well, a prime square is, of course, this square, and so that's u a u dagger, u a u dagger, plus u a u dagger, u d u dagger, plus u d u dagger, u a u dagger. I feel a little silly writing this out, but um, u d u dagger, u d u dagger. All right, so this is what it is. And now, um, let's recall that the identity is u, u dagger, so zero is the exterior derivative on i, and that's du, u dagger, um, plus u, d, u dagger. And so we can say that u, d, u dagger, this is something we've used before, u d u dagger is minus d u times u dagger. Alright, are we all, everybody happy? Let me get out of the way. Now what happens is, this is a remarkable cancellation. Namely, a prime squared plus d a prime. You just add these things together and you see there are a lot of cancellations. Um, let, 
let me uh, write them down. Let me first write this thing down, and this is du a u dagger. So I'm writing d a prime first plus u d a u dagger minus u a d u dagger plus d u d u dagger and so why am I interested in this combination of a squared and d a? Uh, you'll see because it's magic. <laughs> and then we add in the a squared term, and what we get is plus u a squared u dagger plus u a d u dagger minus d u a u dagger minus d u d u dagger. Um, and in this, I, in the a prime term, notice I collapsed these two and replaced it by the identity. I collapsed these two and replaced it by the identity. And then uh, I made use here of u du dagger. I wrote this as minus du u dagger. And then I took the u du dagger and I collapsed this into the identity, which gave this last term. So now, if we look at this, we see wholesale cancellations. In fact, this whole, everything here cancels and leaves us with u a squared plus da u dagger. So in other words, under a gauge transformation, da prime plus a prime squared is the same thing as da plus a squared inside of u u dagger. So da plus a, DA plus a squared transforms homogeneously with no extra derivative term. And so that's why the Maxwell term F is dA plus A squared. So that's, that's the, the very cute, slick way in which with forms you can write, uh, write the field strength. And this field strength we've just shown transforms as Uf u dagger. All right, there are a couple of more uh, cute things. We can define a covariant derivative. I thought the field strength was just dA, though. I mean, when did this a squared pop up? Isn't the field strength just dA? That's the abelian field strength. OK. This, we're talking Yang Mills now. So you're right. In the abelian case, it's just dA. But in the Angle's case is da plus a squared. Well, I mean, why is that though? It's not like a squared vanishes in the abelian case. Yes, it does. It does? Yes. Because a mu commutes with a nu. In the abelian case, they're just numbers. So that in the Yang-Mills case, they're matrices. So the first part's symmetric, you're saying, and then it's symmetric times anti-symmetric and it vanishes. In other words, it's a commutator zero. In the abelian case, the t's are just numbers. Mm -hmm. In non abelian case, they have non commuting matrices. In other words, the commutator vanishes, right? There's a commutator vanishes yeah. in the abelian case, yes. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So, we're led to define. We add the exterior derivative to the one form and we get a covariant derivative. And moreover, you can see that d squared is d plus a, obviously, squared. d squared is zero. So this is dA plus ad plus a squared. 
And now, when we're writing it this way, this thing is, so to speak, still active. So this is equal to dA is equal to d on A minus AD plus AD plus A squared. And so now this is dA plus A squared, which is what we call F. You see where where there's, there's always this this uh, notational issue. Does dA mean d acting on A? That's the way we were treating it here. Or does dA mean d acts on A and then everything to the right of it? And that's the way we were treating it here. But when we work it out, the part that the part that acts on everything to the right of it is gone, and so this is just d acting on a, which is what we meant by f squared. f, d a plus a squared is f. And for abelian theories, when we were talking about forms originally, we said that df, well, what was df? Well, f, we said, was da in the abelian case. And so df is d squared a, which is automatically zero. And these are the two homo Maxwell equations. Okay, two homogeneous Maxwell equations. Here we have big df, which by which we mean df plus af. Now here I'm taking the commutator of A with the, uh, the commutator of the one form with the field string. And so this is D on DA plus A squared plus A on DA plus A squared. Well, D squared is certainly zero. So this is DA squared plus A dA minus dA A. And of course, A commutes with A squared. Um, so where does the commutator come from? Because if I just look at the form for DA, right, it okay. looks like it should just be DF plus AF. Right. Um, the way I'm thinking of it is that when you define the covariant derivative here, you're you sort of know that you're in the adjoint representation. This, do people, and the way, people sometimes write this with the, like an open commutator with the A to indicate that you're supposed to take the commutator? Yeah, I guess. I, I, I don't remember. But um, the way I'm thinking of it is that It's, I just thought of, I just took it as a, I, I just took it as a definition which made sense to me because the, uh, when you're talking about the gauge fields and the field strength, you're always in the adjoint representation of the gauge group. And so that was the way uh, I took it. There may be a deeper reason or a slicker way of doing it. And uh, A uh, commutes with A squared, so that term is gone. Um, and uh, so what do we have? What do we have left here? We have, um, oh yes, D on A squared. This is DA times A minus A dA, and then there's plus A dA, and then minus dA on A. And so this one cancels this one, and this one cancels this one, so all together it gets zero. Let me maybe look at this a little more carefully. Um, certainly if A were simply a matrix, we'd say that A commutes with A squared. But here, this is actually a one form. So let's 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 look at it a little bit more clear, carefully. 
And let me use Roman indices just to make it a little bit. Um, can't you just prove for any group that A will commute with the function of A? I'm 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 being I'm being extra careful. Hold on a second. Doesn't know what that's do. Okay. So this is in other words A I A J A K the X I well we do it this way. So being extra careful, this is what it looks like, right? Right? I'm just using IJK instead of mu nu lambda because it's easier. Um, now we can we can make this look like that. If we um, change the names, we make sort of a cyclic permutation of the names. So we let J go to I, K go to J, and I go to K. But then this term will be dx. Is A squared really A wedge? Dx. Oh, hold on. Let me just do this. I can only do. So I've, re I've rewritten this term like this by relabeling the, 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 the indices. And now I can go back to this by just moving this to here, but it's two minus sign, so, it, so there's no change. And now we see it, it really is zero. A squared is A wedge A, really, right? Yes. Okay, so um, what do we have here? We have df is zero, and these are the these are two homogeneous uh, Maxwell Yang Mills equations. All right, now um, what is f squared? How's the time doing? What is f squared? Well, f squared, of course, is f mu nu f rho sigma, and then it's going to be dx mu dx nu dx rho dx sigma. So this thing is proportional, basically, to epsilon mu nu lambda sigma f mu nu f rho sigma. In other words, this is this is what we would write it as conventionally. And in fact, this is the funny term that people talk about when they talk about the strong CP problem. This is sort of the E dot, non abelian E dot B. See, E would be 0i, B would be JK. So it's basically an E dot B. Let's consider the trace of f squared. And in fact, let's consider the exterior derivative of the trace of f squared. Well, that's going to be the trace of dff. f is a two form, so it's plus f df. Okay, so this is the trace of d of ga plus a squared f plus f df. Okay, so it's all that. Now dd is zero, so this simplifies to d a squared f plus f. D 
T A squared. And this is T A A F minus A T A F plus F T A A plus no minus F A T A. Now, if we remember what F is, then we have DAA, DA plus A squared minus A, DA I should have factored this, but in my notes I just factored. Alright, let me, let me write it in factorized form, which is a little bit simpler. So this is DA times A minus A DA times DA plus A squared plus F is DA plus A squared and the multiplicative terms are DA times A minus A DA. And this is all inside a trace. And So you know the tr the trace of um, well actually you don't even need to use the trace aspect of this now that I think about it um, all right let me let me just multiply this out it's trace of d a a d a plus d a a cubed minus a d a squared minus a d a a squared plus d a squared a minus d a a d a plus a squared d a a minus a cubed d a. Okay, well, some of these cancel directly. Other ones you use the, the fact that trace of um, and so what cancels? Well, this guy here I called A and it cancels it cancels this one. So I'll call this underscore A. This is a B here, and it cancels the last term. But the, di the difference is that um, the order is opposite. But the trace, because of the simplicity of the trace, um, those cancel. This one I call D for some reason. And it cancels, well, it cancels this one here, again, talking about the, um, the, the, the property of the trace. And now I guess we have to call this one C, and it cancels this one over here. Again, because you can You can. Well, that one's a little bit trickier, actually. No, it's not. You, you just you just move all the a's. This is minus. I mean, with the trace, it's minus d a a cubed, and this one is plus d a a cubed. At least using the that property of the trace, I. Um, what I'll just assert is that if you put in indices and do it extra carefully, it still works. And so what you get then is that the exterior derivative of the trace of f squared is zero in the non abelian case. Uh, now, um, let me say something then. 
So, so let, let's take it for granted that I didn't move, go too fast here. Uh, I mean, I, I might have been too sloppy, but it's nonetheless correct. So this says that the trace of f squared is, is closed because its exterior derivative vanishes. So the trace is in the adjoint representation of the gauge group, right? That's what trace would Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, 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 yeah, yeah, you can say that, but um, I think when we're talking about, what, once we're talking about f as dA plus a squared, we're <coughs> sure that all of this works no matter what representation. Right, so, but it's in the given representation of the given. Any representation. Yeah. So that, but that's going to leave the, the Lorentz indices alone, right? And that's why yeah. you can still have something that's not a number afterwards. Right. So this thing is closed. That is to say, trace f squared is closed. But then by Poincaré's lemma, at least locally, we can say trace f squared is dq. That is to say, it's locally exact. So what I want you guys to do as a homework problem is to show that you can take as q the trace of ADA plus two-thirds a cubed. And if, uh, what I want to show you, what I want you to show is that if q is this, then dq is trace of f squared. And now, what I recommend is that you be careful on the level of um, the way I did things here. That is to say, put in the dx's, and uh, reshuffle the dummy indices, and use the cyclicity of the trace. But um, I'm, uh, I'm all right. So that, that's what I recommend. <coughs> Meanwhile, I'll just do. I'll do. Um, I'll show you a part of this uh, uh, this thing. Trace of f squared, you see, will involve an a to the fourth term, because trace of f squared is trace of dA plus a squared squared. Okay. So there's going to be a trace of a to the fourth. And you can see, as the, if the exterior derivative hits this, you're not going to get an a to the fourth. So it must be the trace of a to the fourth vanishes identically. I'm going to show you that now, and that will show you what the spirit is for doing that. I think maybe this blackboard is the one that has the least writing. Probably because I was waving my hands more rapidly when going through this cusp race. That was phase transition. By the way, these cosmic strings aren't quite as fashionable as they used to be, but they're still possible. They might exist. All right, let's look at trace a to the fourth. Why is this zero? Well, it's going to be a trace of a i a j a k a l the x i the x j the x k dx out. I always find that if I use Roman indices, it's a little simpler. It's just one fewer subroutine that your brain has to call in understanding these things. Okay. Well, the first thing 